evening, everybody, and g'day, g'day. My name is Dr. Kira Lindsay. I'm a historian, I'm a biographer, and, um, and I'm also the Vice President of the History Council of New South Wales. So welcome to tonight, which is uh, part of our series called The History Effect, and the mini-series that we run inside that, known as Careers in History, which we've been running for quite a few years now. It's an opportunity for you to hear from historians, from history, heritage practitioners, from museum curators, from researchers, and all sorts of other history professionals as they share their experiences and tips, as well as their career journeys throughout within the winding roads and many paths of the history world. But before we go any further, tonight I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land where the History Council is based, and also where I'm based tonight. Acknowledging country is something that we now actively do throughout Australia. Um, and it reminds us that the land that we live and work on is unceded sovereign Aboriginal land. And yet while this has become a familiar act of conscious history making all over our nation, it's something that we at the History Council of New South Wales take particularly seriously because it provides us with an opportunity to do what we do, that is to reflect upon the role of the history in our everyday lives, to take a moment to think about the legacies of the past and the fact that all over Australia, Aboriginal people have not only survived those legacies, but continue to thrive in myriad ways. So I invite you to take just this small moment, this slither of time to reflect upon the enormous resilience of Aboriginal custodians wherever you are, and to pay your respects to elders past and present, and to also express some gratitude for the beautiful country and culture that they continue to so generously share with us. So get a job, pursue a profession, create a career, voice your true vocation or follow the call of the wild. The world of work, that is doing what you love and getting paid for it if you're lucky, is undoubtedly a lifelong adventure and probably best embarked upon with a spirit of curiosity and adventure because sooner or later you're probably going to go down some pretty strange rabbit holes. Um, and unexpected paths. You might start in one place, you probably will, and end up somewhere very different. Maybe not where you thought you were going to be. But it can often turn out that those places, those side routes, those byways and laneways, they can be the places where you really enjoy yourself and you make a contribution. And we learn this particularly, we know this as historians, because what we've just dis discovering more and more over the years is that history itself is becoming extremely diverse and enterprising. In other words, there is not only so many ways to do history, but an increasingly different number of ways to be a historian. And that is hugely exciting for you all, because it means that there are lots of opportunities, opportunities that already exist, and opportunities that you can create for yourself. So tonight we have three speakers who are going to talk about their journeys, their experiments, their explorations, and their creative experiences in creating their own careers. We have Dr. Ian Stewart, Dr. Carlin de Montfort, and um, de Montfort, I'm sorry, Carlin, I just realised I stumbled over your name there, and Dr. Meg Foster. Each of them are going to speak for about 10 minutes with an opportunity for you to ask questions immediately after the speaker, which I'll um, field and wrangle and try and find a way to make that um, pass over and be understood by the rest of um, our audience tonight. And then at the end of that, after we've heard from each speaker, we're going to have a, a, a few moments, hopefully, um, to ask the whole panel a few questions, and then we'll wrap up hopefully around 7.30. So I think we should just crack on right into it. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Carlin de Montfort, who um, is an assistant curator at the Sydney Living Museums. He's based in house museums and working within the broader curatorial team. He undertakes a variety of tasks in that role from collection care and documentation and house presentation to interpretation, research and writing. 
it sounds like a really cool job. <laughs> um, and what he likes, well, some of the things he loves most about his work is the variety, working with unique buildings and collections and sharing these places with his audience. So over to you, Carlin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the um, invitation to speak tonight. Um, I'll just share my screen before going on. Okay, so yeah, good evening. Um, my name's Carlin de Montfort. Um, this is Jolene, one of our chickens at Rouse Hill that's in this photo here. Um, and I'm an assistant curator at Sydney Living Museums. Um, I'm in the house museums, um, I'm based in the house museums. Uh, but Sydney Living Museums looks after 12 historic houses, gardens, and museums in New South Wales. And um, they often like to add collections to that as well. Um, the houses that I work at are Elizabeth Farm, uh, which is the home of John and Elizabeth MacArthur. Uh, Rouse Hill Estate was the home to six generations of the Rouse and Terry families. And we have um, a huge collection stored in situ in the house, which is one of the things that makes that property so special. Um, and also, Marugal, where I get to a little less often, uh, but was to the home to four generations of women from a local family in Nowra. And currently I'm uh, acting as a curator at Hyde Park Barracks for a short period of time. So what's it like to be an assistant curator in a house museum? Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege to have, to work so up so close and personally with the collections and the um, houses. But if I was to sum it up in a word that's probably a little bit different to what a lot of people expect for a curatorial role is it's dusty. Um, there is a lot of uh, housekeeping involved. It's fairly hands-on. Uh, we spend a lot of time dusting for the presentation of the properties, but also uh, for the conservation of the collections. Sometimes it's even very dusty. This is a building called the Wool Shed, which is one of the outbuildings at Rouse Hill. Um, it's one of the most complicated areas collection-wise in the building. And recently I've been involved in a project where we've had to document and move this uh, huge collection from inside the building so that structural works can take place to the main wool shed itself. And this is the aftershot. And this is just a really small part of that building. Sometimes even it's not dusty working in a house museum. Um, this is just a small screen grab from a story that I was able to write on um, John Wattsford, uh, James Wattsford, who was John MacArthur's coachman. And it was, um, this is where you also get to work a little bit in terms of the storytelling and interpretation and exploring some of those stories behind our properties. And so I guess looking at career paths. Um, how did I become a curator? Well, it's been a long journey for me. It started um, at the end of 2005. And when I was about a year out of university, I managed to get one of those front of house roles at High Park Barracks, uh, which involved, um, we were called guides. It involved delivering education programs, um, delivering tours and a lot of the operations behind opening and closing all that sort of museum work. Um, I got there because I had a little bit of experience working with children, which was good for the education programs, a little bit of customer service experience. And I volunteered for a little while as well on the um, Endeavour Replica as a guide. So I had a little bit of guiding experience behind me. It wasn't much, but these things came together to get that um, sort of foot in the door role in a museum. I then decided about a year and a half after that to do my PhD in history. And that's probably a whole talk by itself. Um, it took me around four and a half years. I think most people expected to finish it a little bit more quickly, but it doesn't often happen like that. Um, and I was able to do those little bits of professional development that you get to do when you're doing a PhD tutoring in history, um, attending conferences, getting one or two small um, articles published. But then after that, I found myself back 
front of house at Hyde Park Barracks uh, because I'd continued to work through there to um, pay my way through my degree and I didn't find that next role necessarily really quickly. And this is probably a little bit of an area where I found myself in a little bit of a rut and stuck in that same role and not really knowing what was going to be next. I applied for a lot of external roles, but I ended up staying at the barracks and starting to do a little few more, oops, wrong way. And starting to do more internal jobs. So um, through an internal EOI, I got some experience based we're working with collections, working on a mold remediation project uh, within the organization. And that was great because I started to get um, a little bit more of that hands-on experience and it was the first real behind the scenes experience behind um, in the museums. Then back at front of house at Hyde Park Barracks for a while. And the next DOI I got was working on a collection move where we got to move um, a whole of our collection into a new dedicated collection store at the museum's discovery center, which is a shared facility between um, the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, the Australian Museum and Sydney Living Museums. And that was another great bit of experience to get working really hands-on and really behind the scenes with collections. And that was where I got to work with collections across all of our 12 um, sites. And then it was back front of house at Hyde Park Barracks again, <laughs> until um, I was able to apply for a third inter internal EOI. And within an organisation like Sydney Living Museums, uh, these internal EOIs are pretty much as much work as a full recruitment outside of the organisation. So they were fairly formal, which was hard work at the time, um, but they were really great because they gave you a lot of experience um, going through that recruitment process, attending a panel interview and doing all that. So they really were worth the work that you had to put into them. And then after that, uh, I wasn't back to Hyde Park Barracks. I did manage to um, get an ongoing role as an assistant curator in the House Museum. So it was a really good opportunity. Um, and then currently, yeah, I'm acting as curator at Hyde Park Barracks. So it's a little bit like coming full circle within the organisation, but it's also back to that step of starting to build um, a little bit of those additional experiences, working higher duties, again, starting to build up um, your experience. So I guess getting closer to the end of the, the um, 10 minutes is that career advice. So for me, um, this applies to my sort of trajectory through Sydney Living Museums. There's lots of different ways to do this. So this advice won't necessarily be work for everyone or you may well be able to move more quickly through an organisation than I did. But for me, it was to have patience because it did take uh, time to move through and to gain experience. It's that the skills and knowledge take time to build. Um, some people may pick things up more quickly than me, but it did take me quite a while to start to build my experience to that professional level to be able to start getting the roles that I'm, that I'm getting now. Keep trying. Um, I think that's a really important one. Right when I first started with Sydney Living Museums, back when, back when we were Historic Houses Trust, um, that was the second time I'd applied for that guiding role. Um, applying for these internal EOIs, it was not the first time that I'd applied for an assistant curator position within the organisation. Um, you know, and I had my PhD by that point. So it does take time. Keep trying. Don't give up. You commit to your role. And that's one that took me probably a little bit of time to learn, particularly when you're finding yourself in a role. It might be an entry-level role in an organisation, in an institution, um, and you may want to be taking other steps and be somewhere else, but find what it is in your role that really works and find what it is that you get value out of that. Um, so, yeah, commit to where you are. Be flexible, um, which, from my perspective, it means taking advantage of those opportunities that come up, whether that means uh, mould remediation or some sort of other work. You might, you might find you like it. Um, I found I really enjoyed working with those collections once I took that sort of 
step into somewhere that was probably a little bit different from where I thought I was going when I was qualifying and researching and doing that sort of work. Avoid burnout, which is again, if it's taking a little bit longer than you expect to start a, your career in history or in your organization, have other things as well as your work that might, um, it gives meaning to your life and that you find value in rather than just the career, especially if that isn't going as quickly or necessarily in the same directions that you think it might. And then back to have patience because that's what worked for me. Um, I could have maybe quit my job and taken that great big step out into the unknown, but for where I was at and what worked for me, I chose the security of ongoing positions and I worked my way up from within the organisation and I have that organisational knowledge with where I am now. So having that patience and sticking to it was what worked for me. So that's my 10 minutes, so thank you. I hope there's some questions out of that. Kira, if you can please unmute. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Callum, thank you so much. That was terrific and, and fantastic images too. And, um, you know, I suppose if we knew that we were entering into jobs that involved mould remediation, the whole world would be quite different. Like, I'm just wondering what that would look like on the selection criteria. So we have quite a few questions for you. You've generated a okay. lot of excitement. Um, and, and there's a, a kind of a cluster around your PhD. Some people are wondering whether a PhD is necessary if your PhD research has um, actually provided you with the kind of entree or leverage that you were hoping for um, and what qualities and skills you might have got from the PhD that um, has complemented it. And also, I'm just going to put them all together so you can riff on the theme. And the other one is, have you been able to um, keep publishing in your PhD, uh, from your PhD while you've been in this job? And then there's just one last question, which was, was your undergraduate degree in history as well? So did you kind of transfer that way as well? Yeah, yeah. So something again, I uh, <laughs> skipped over a little bit in the presentation. Yeah, my undergraduate uh, degree was in history as well. So I did honours history before working at um, at the barracks in the first place. And that was mm. a key to getting that role. Um, yeah, so the PhD, I... Is it worth it, do you think? Was it, has it been a, a necessary thing in terms of leverage, but also practical skills or valuable skills that you've acquired. Yeah, yeah. It's it's worth it now. Um, it's taken it's taken a long time to recognise that and to see um, where that comes from and how that um, pans out. Um, it was probably frustrating early on and I um, and I was thinking I want to be in a job where I'm using all these skills that I got. And it's where my point about making the most of where you're at comes from. Because what I realised was Number one, that museums were a great place to be and even that role, taking tours, selling the tickets, being front of house was a great place to be. It was great to work in that position. But then the second thing was that, yeah, I was I was using the skills that I got through the PhD, even if I hadn't really recognised it. So um, doing the best you can with where you're at and actually and actually using that. Yeah. I was using it there and it was, and it was worth it. Um, I have not continue to publish a lot uh i think those opportunities are there but when life takes over it's not something that i have spent a lot of time doing um those skills are something i'm very much using now um yeah, writing now skills, working, writing skills acting in a curatorial role um and i'm bringing together both the collection skills and the collection work that i build up and also that interpretation side of things those um sophisticated writing skills, the analysis, all of that. So definitely worth it in the long term. Didn't always see it yeah. shortly afterwards. It took some time, but it was worth right. it. Right. 
You know what they say, if you argue, if you argue with reality, you're going to lose every time. <laughs> and sometimes when you make a transition from one reality to another, you sort of there's a little bit of a delayed reaction there. We've got some questions also um, which I think are really interesting. One is about how can you volunteer during a pandemic like ours? Um, do you have any suggestions around that? And then another question that's kind of practically practical in its um inquiry which is um an, another person's just finished a bachelor degree in history but they're having difficulties finding where to even look for jobs um should they be looking for only online platforms or do you recommend cold contacting organizations like Sydney living museums um an organization like Sydney living museums has fairly um uh, sort of formal requirements for getting those jobs. They'll tend to be advertised, um, but it's definitely worth staying in touch, staying involved. Um, you can join uh, some of our volunteer programs um, and they don't necessarily have to be doing a lot of work every week or um, something like that. We have a big volunteers program for the Sydney Open and we have a lot of what we call event volunteers um, and they help come and help the run the Sydney Open every year um, yeah. and so that so that's something that you can do on a smaller amount but it starts to get you into the organization and having those contacts so you can do that um, volunteering during a pandemic I don't have an easy answer for that it's been pretty tough on some of our regular volunteers who um, regularly do um, work in our museums talk to visitors do that sort of thing with being uh, sort of closed down a bit. We're, we're definitely working a lot though with our volunteers while we're closed down, uh, while we're, we're doing a lot of um, online presentations, training, that sort of thing. It tends to be a little bit more with our existing group of volunteers, but it's, but again, it's definitely, um, you can get in touch yeah. with our coordinator, yeah. And it's likely that Sydney Open this year might be online as well. So mm. there might be some um, opportunities for, for new volunteers. But I hope that one of the things that we picked up from Carlin's fantastic presentation and story is that he's patched together a number of different skills that he's acquired elsewhere, you know, the, the skills in working with children, education, being a guy, and then those formal skills of an undergraduate degree that kind of all combined to, be, to put him in the right place at the right time. But, you know, you, you do go through a journey in that regard to acquire those different skills. And so patience is a, is a highly valued uh, quality. <laughs> so thank you very much, Carlin. Um, that was terrific. And we'll come back to you in the panel. And uh, well done on your chook shed and your mould management. <laughs> Our next speaker tonight is Dr Meg Foster. And Meg is an award-winning historian of bushranging, settler colonial and public history. She's also a research fellow at the University of Cambridge. Along her, alongside her academic trajectory, Meg has worked as a public historian. She's featured in his, historical documentaries and she's engaged in artistic collaborations. Meg has a real breadth of experience, in fact, when it comes to engaging academic and public audiences and has a passion for connecting history to the contemporary world. So most recently, in fact, in forms of writing about how history can be used to understand, guess what, COVID-19. She has a book coming out called Boundary Crosses, The Hidden History of Australia's Other Bushrangers, which will Go out with come out with New South next year. Over to you, Dr. Foster. Great. Thank you, Kira. And I will also share my screen. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so I'd also like to um, Kind of second what Kira said and also pay my respects. I'm lucky enough to actually be in Sydney at the moment, which is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, so as Kira said, I've worked as a public historian. Um, my trajectory is 
once again, a little bit interesting, a little bit unpredictable. I wouldn't have thought at the beginning that I would have taken the different routes that I did. Um, I started off doing a undergraduate degree in history and sociology at Sydney University. I originally didn't think that I would be an historian. Um, I thought I'd do law afterwards, but by the third year of uni, I was just hooked on history and I did honours in history. Um, I did my honours thesis on popular representations of Aboriginal bushrangers. Um, after honours, I was pretty sure I wanted to do a PhD, um, but I hadn't taken a gap year after high school or anything, so I wanted to travel um, and work for a little bit first. And so um, I actually cold emailed any historical organisation I could find after honours. I sent my CV, I sent a brief cover letter, talking about my interests and what I thought I would bring to each organisation. Um, a lot of places I didn't hear back from at all, um, but I was lucky enough to email the Australian Centre for Public History um, and I got an email back from Professor Paul Ashton, who had just started working on a project looking at new directions in public history and he hired me as a research assistant. And from that, I actually published my first journal article, which was on digital technologies and public history. Um, after my year traveling, I came back and I started a PhD at University of New South Wales, looking at other bushrangers, bushrangers who weren't white men. Um, and alongside that, I actually picked up a lot of different consultancy projects too. So one of the things I'll be talking about today is how things really snowball and the connections that you make really lead to experiences that you could never have anticipated. Um, so I'm my introduction about myself is quite short because I really want to focus on the advice part of this talk, um, but there will be plenty of time at the end to go through if anyone wants to ask me more questions about my trajectory. Um, and also I'll say to these slides will be available afterwards and this is all being recorded. So if we don't get through everything or you haven't jotted everything down, there's always a backup. Um, so right from the very start, I want to say kind of seconding what Colin said, there's no one way or one right way to develop a career in history. Um, and that's something that it took me a while to learn. I learned the hard way, but it's something that I think is really important to understand from the get-go. So unlike other disciplines, there's not a specific path you have to follow. Um, success has a lot to do with taking initiative about making connections with different people and occasionally luck. So being at the right place, the right time and having your name mentioned. Um, but that being said, there are some things you can do to really help your chances and develop unique and transferable skills, that, that word again, transferable skills, um, to engage with a wide variety of stakeholders. And that's the approach that I've taken. Um, so the first thing I'd say is try to establish networks. So sometimes you can do that through organisations, and I've provided a list here. So the Australian Historical Association is the chief body for Australian historians, Professional Historians Association, the chief body for professional historians who work in the public sphere. Um, so these types of organisations are really important, not just for establishing a sense of community because history work can be quite isolating, but also learning about other people's research and other people learning about your research. So word of mouth is really, really important in getting any type of work in the history field. Um, I'd also say community organisations are important too. So in my own research, I've looked at a Chinese bushranger, for example, and I ended up working with the Chinese Heritage Association, doing work with them. Um, and one of my bushrangers was actually in Rye in Sussex um, for a period of time. And I reached out to them and ended up doing a bit of collaborative work with them as well. So this is where that kind of dual part of initiative coming in, but also word of mouth from reaching out from being a part of these organizations. It's kind of like a win-win to be a part of groups like this. Um, following on from that, mentors are really, really important. Um, reach out to people who are established in the field. And I mean, some of you may be asking, well, how do I, how do I even get a mentor? Um, so if you've done undergraduate study, sometimes the academics who've taught you or your tutors might be a good place to start, but also history professionals, um, historical community is very, very generous. 
And so if you come across someone who has the same research interests as you, oftentimes if you just send them an email about kind of your mutual interest, then that will start the conversation flowing. And sometimes if you want, you can ask people directly if they know about any types of jobs in the area, but a lot of people don't know of something in the moment, but they'll remember you later on and they'll remember your interest. So just keep that in mind. Um, so as I said, study conferences and workplaces is a good place to find mentors. And I would also say to cast your net quite widely. So anyone who communicates about the past and the present. So that includes artists, TV, radio, podcasting. Obviously, if you're a public historian, you try to engage a really wide audience. And so your mentors should come from just as many different places. Um, insider knowledge is very important when it comes to finding a career in history. Finding out how things work, oftentimes you really need to have that insider perspective because reading a website of an organisation or just trying to look at things from the kind of public-facing um, outputs that an organisation presents, it, the, the actual um, mechanisms of how things work on the ground are oftentimes quite different to that public facade. And so finding a mentor really helps you to establish that behind-the-scenes view of what is actually happening, how do I get in, how do things work? Um, so once again, I think it's important from the get-go to say that this is a hard terrain to navigate. And so a mentor is really a guide who's going to help you to go through this and actually make a lot of really exciting connections and learn things that you wouldn't have otherwise. This is something that I think is also incredibly important and that has really shaped my own career. Take opportunities when they present themselves. So in this industry, things often snowball. You'll take one job, you'll attend one conference, meet one person, and that often leads further down the track to new opportunities that you would never have anticipated. So a lot of the project I've worked on have been very unexpected. To use the example of the Chinese Bush Ranger again, I attended a Chinese history conference, um, a Chinese Australian curator was there. He put me in touch with an artist and we actually collaborated on an artwork based on this Chinese Bush Ranger's life. So these types of things I can't say enough are very unexpected and sometimes it throws your, your plans for study or other work kind of into a bit of disarray because these things come out of the blue. But if you can, really make the space for them because they are worth it. And not just the one project, but as I said, that opens up future possibilities that wouldn't otherwise be there. Um, the other thing I would say is don't be put off if you're offered work that doesn't directly align with your area of research. Uh, once again, you have transferable skills. Take every opportunity you can instead of waiting for the perfect fit. Because the more work you do, the more you're known in this industry, the more you will actually be offered work in your direct field, but also the more you're renowned as a good worker, someone who's conscientious, someone who knows their stuff. And so just don't wait for what you think is the perfect job. Just make what job is offered to you the perfect fit that you can. To get as much out of it as you can. Um, also be assertive, create opportunities. And this is quite hard, especially when you're trying to establish yourself because you think, well, I don't really have a foothold in the field yet. How do I go about doing this type of thing? It is quite daunting, but if you can, I really recommend going out there and taking up initiative where you can. There are a lot of public events that you can actually be involved with. So the History Council of New South Wales does History Week, for example, and they put out a call for people to do events. Recently this year, I ran one on, um, well, sorry, last year I ran one on historical responses to COVID-19. Um, and so that's once again, something where I'm not an expert on COVID-19, but I am someone who's interested in public history and how we make sense of our present moment through using the past, things like historical consciousness. And so from that, I drew together a panel and we presented at History Week. And from that, actually, I ended up publishing um, a journal article with colleagues and also a book chapter by myself. So. This is one of those other things where situations, events, work that you take up, it kind of spirals in a way, in a positive way that you wouldn't anticipate. 
The other thing I would say, um, especially when you're getting started, is publish widely in both public and academic forums. Okay, so I um, this is something that I wasn't sure about recently. I was actually speaking to um, a colleague of mine at Cambridge, Mary Beard, about whether I should lean into the public side or the academic side of my work a bit more. And her answer, um, which is also the answer of my PhD supervisor, Grace Caskins, was just diversify your output. Okay, so have your academic journal article, have your academic book chapter book, but also engage other audiences, write blog posts, write for the conversation, write in literary journals like Mean Journal, Sydney Review of Books. Make sure your research is out there. And that's really important in terms of proving to future employers that you're up to date with advances in your field, but also that you've got communication skills to really engage a diverse audience. It's once again, a win-win, whether you're taking the academic route or the public history route, these things are beneficial in both instances. So once you've actually started publishing, um, you should really register with the copyright agency. This is something that I've only discovered recently, and I wish I would was told when I was a bit more, um, a bit less established in my career, I would say, but that's what I'm telling you now. So the copyright agency collects royalties on your behalf when libraries lend your books to clients or when schools or universities copy your material for classes, things like that. And so in many instances, you actually receive a sum of money for that. Um, I'm not going to go into it now. I'm not an expert on the copyright agency, but I am a beneficiary of it. So um, I've included the website here and you can click on the membership tab for more information. Okay, so. I think I'm doing okay with time. So now you have work in public history or consultancy, now what? First thing is money. <laughs> Some companies, especially in film and TV, expect historians to work for free. So their logic, although it hasn't actually been told to me quite this explicitly, this is my interpretation, um, is that exposure is good for us historians. And so the exchanges that our labor pays off against their exposure. Um, I don't believe that's the case in many instances. And so if you are offered a job and no one mentions money, you have the right to bring it up. Don't feel squeamish about it. Don't feel like you're being rude. You have every right to ask about whether you're going to be compensated for your time and your labour. We are highly skilled professionals and we deserve to be paid. Um, if you ask and the people in charge say, no, there's no room in the budget, um, then it's your call. So you might decide that actually it is worth you partaking in the project anyway because you do believe the exposure will be good, you believe in that snowball effect, you've got the time, whatever it is. Um, but you can also politely decline after that if they're not going to pay you and money is something that is really important to most people. Um, but also so you can gauge about how much you should be looking at for your career stage um, I provided a link to the Professional Historians Association who have their scale of fees based on your experience. This is about what you can ask for. And also you can provide that scale of fees to a potential employer and say, well, look, I fit into category this. This is about the rate that I should be paid. The other thing I would say is expectations. Make sure that you and your employer or collaborator have a clear understanding of your role and the expectations around your work at the beginning of the project. If something's unclear, always ask for more information. If there's an unrealistic expectation, so something's impossible to do in a certain time, for example, be upfront about it. And I know that can be hard, especially when you're starting out and you really wanna please people, you wanna get a good reputation. But if something's not viable, it's gonna be better telling the person you're working with at the beginning rather than having it go wrong later down the track. And this is once again, especially the case with film and TV, where production people are used to having really tight schedules. Um, I, in one instance, was working on a pre-production show and had to really tell my boss that I didn't know that some of the documents, historical documents she wanted even existed, let alone that I would be able to get them, transcribe them, and then give them to the rest of the team in time. So just being really upfront about that. Also correct people on your team, correct your collaborator if they get the history wrong. 
So it can be awkward if someone's made an assumption or misinterpreted the history you've presented to them, but you need to put them straight. And so, as I said, remember you're not a buzzkill. And it can be hard not to feel like that sometimes, especially when people get really excited. They think they've kind of, they're onto something quite new, but it's your job to really make sure that they're, they're doing justice to the history. Um, you can also put forward making changes. So you can negotiate if things don't seem to be um, viable, if there's something missing, if you think there's something that could be done better, um, if there's a missed opportunity, say something. So you are a collaborator, you are working with other people, you're part of a team. And so you have every right to negotiate that as well. And you want to do the best work and you want the project you're working on to be the best it can be. So you definitely have the right to discuss that as well. Um, this is going to be very hard for a lot of professionally trained historians, especially ones coming out of academia, letting go. Letting go of being the sole authority of history. So public history work is largely collaborative. You'll be working with other people who will have very different objectives from what you're used to. Um, and while it's important to be clear on the history, the final decision of how it's interpreted may not be up to you. Um, this can be quite distressing. I know I had to work through processing it in a few different instances. Um, but at the same time, engaging with different stakeholders and recognising their different needs and perspectives and priorities when people engage with the past outside of academia is really important. There are sometimes questions of integrity um, around interpretation. If you think that something is being presented in a way that isn't quite true to the history, that can sometimes cause some sticky issues, but these are usually resolved once again with communication. So that goes back to my previous point. Always be very, very clear about where you stand about your role and keep the lines of communication open. And if you're uncomfortable about anything, discuss it really clearly with your employer or your team, your collaborator. Okay. Um, so I, um, once again, to bring up the artist I worked with before I engaged with him, we walked through the history, I shared my primary sources with him, but at the end of the day, he's an artist. So he's going to interpret it in a completely different way and for a completely different audience to what I would normally have access to. Um, and in the end, he did take some liberties, but it was actually pretty true to the history. But at the same time, historians don't own the past. We don't. And part of one of the joys of history is realising that it touches so many people in so many different ways. And so just really I being mindful of that. finish up soon. We're just running yep. a little bit late now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, this is my last point. Just remember that what we do is important. Um, and I think that hopefully has come through in the rest of my presentation. Um, but especially now in moments of crisis, history is important for how we understand the world and what you're doing is significant. So bear that in mind too. And best of luck with everything. Yeah, fantastic. Indeed, absolutely. Thank you, Meg. Um, I just, I think we might just do one question because I'm just conscious of the, the time there. But I was really struck by uh, the fact that um, you put a strong focus on relations as a, a kind of crucial part of how you see your own career development. It's about um, setting boundaries, relating well to people, developing networks. Um, and I just wondered if you um, wanted to riff on that a little bit more and also daring yourself and, and putting yourself out there a little bit more than you might otherwise. What sort of qualities have you needed to develop in yourself to be able to master those sort of relational qualities of your career development? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think um, being really adaptable is, is the first point. And that goes to what I was saying before as well about realizing that you're not the sole authority <laughs> on the past anymore. And sometimes you do have to let go um, of some things. So, but going into it with that mentality, going into it with that collaborative spirit, I think is really important. But also going into any type of public history work with conviction in yourself, in your skills, in your abilities as an historian and your conviction that you actually are going to do the best historical interpretation that you can. And then that 
gives you the confidence to then challenge people if things don't go the way that you think they should and to really engage in a conversation where you're going to back yourself too. So I think those are the two main skills that I would say are really crucial. Thanks, Meg. I think that's really interesting is to think about the authority that we have and the responsibilities and obligations we have to history, historical documents, but also to the, the project. So lots of really interesting um, questions that you've raised there and hopefully we'll get a chance in the panel at the end to um, touch base on a few more of those, but some terrific stuff. And I like this idea of being a little bit assertive, daring yourself, you know, giving yourself a task or an idea to put yourself out there like something in History Council Week that's based on your passions and your interests, collaborating with others to, to do that. It's a great idea. So thank you. Our last speaker, our third and final, is a repeat offender from last year, Dr. Ian Stewart, who has over 25 years of professional experience in Aboriginal and historical archaeology, as well as in the broader areas of industrial archaeology, heritage assessment and management and cultural landscape assessment. Over all that time, 25 years or so, he's also worked in government and private enterprise. He's worked as a volunteer for the non-profit heritage sector. In 2018, he joined Artifact to manage large scale and state significant archeological excavations. This work encompasses everything from Aboriginal, historical, industrial, and maritime spheres of heritage. Sounds so exciting. And among his recent um, publications are articles on Macquarie's towns, Newcastle's defences, and wheat landscapes. Over to you. Ian. <laughs> okay, well, look, I'm going to try and share my screen. So here we are. Look, I, 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 if we wanted to keep it brief, I could say that Nick has covered most of the things um, that I wanted to say in a much more articulate and, and uh, uh, principled way. Um, however, I'll, I'll I'll battle on because I think some of the points are worth saying again. Um, the first, I'm a, you know, like everybody, we're only getting one perspective on history. Um, how did I get started? I, my father was a great, a great interest in history and family history, in history of the areas that he was uh, want, around. We did some trips, um, looked at some historical things. Um, he told me all sorts of stories. Um, not any of them, I think, are true, um, but he had a very good history. Um, uh, he then told me when I started to develop an interest in pursuing history as a profession um, that it would never, ever um, pay. It was not a job I should do. Um, I should be a lawyer um, or someone like, something like that. Um, he didn't quite say accountant. Um, however, um, so I, I can point to his stimulating my interest both in um, getting me interested in the subject and then me spending the next 35 years proving that he was wrong. Um, I think that the uh, that there are two aspects to, I think, the, the, a career in history. One is what I would call the skill set and one I would call the know-how. Now, the skill set is the sort of stuff that you get taught at university and you pick up along the way. And, and these are the basic skills that I have put together for basically heritage historians. Um, You've got to also then have some um, uh, know-how. And, and here are the classic historian's muddy boots. Obviously, prime fam familiarity with primary sources such as land titles, rate books, sands directories, maps and plans, archival photos, how to search trove. Um, the knowledge of the standard secondary sources, which are actually very, very useful because a lot of the secondary sources provide a framework for understanding um, part of the past and you can sort of your particular site might fit into those um, but you've got to be critical about primary and secondary sources um, have a great sense of skepticism about things even when they come from archives with dates on them um, and of course if you're working in heritage in New South Wales familiarity with the heritage office guidelines for assessing criteria A and B um, so we can, a lot of people can just do the basic research, they can do the land titles, but the historian skills 
really in the understanding of the broader historical context, the pattern and flow of history that can set the history of a place into the bigger picture of the past and then understand how that contributes to the overall importance of the place. And here is, of course, um, a standard history. Um, one of the interesting things about history is time. Um, for, for those of you who are familiar with the Annales School, there's the long durée, um, the famous long durée. In terms of heritage consulting, there's the billable durée, which comes to some of the points that Meg was talking about. Um, you've got to really also work out how to do these things efficiently and quickly. And that's possibly where you're, as you get on in your career, your skill set builds up because you've learned the history by doing it. And so when you come back to an area, you can say, okay, these are the sources, this is the context. Um, so you need to work out how to do, do everything in 15 minute blocks. But then good writing skills, um, you've got to communicate your stuff. And, um, you know, long sentences are, um, are very hard to read. When I went back and did my PhD, I wrote, uh, as you do, a, a sort of introductory essay to my supervisors, and they were very puzzled by it because they said each sentence only had one idea in it, um, and they sort of flowed logically. So being a cynic, I took out every second paragraph, um, carriage return, and resubmitted, and they loved it because it was totally incomprehensible. Um, so if you're coming from the academic world, I suggest you, you go in reverse, but also think of the standard tools that we have to help us make ourselves understand the, um, the style manual, which is now online, the Chicago manual of style, the dictionaries, um, to help you communicate your information. Um, and also working with other disciplines. This is really the hardest thing I think often in heritage and, and being historians, you've got to work with other disciplines. And sometimes they don't really recognize or value you. Um, and, and frequently you find um, historians saying, well, they wanted me to write the history of, of Sydney and they gave me 20 hours to do it in. And, um, and that's really a hard thing to negotiate. And I think that's something that Meg was, was also talking about. Um, people have really unrealistic expectations of what a good history is. But then there's the know-how. And um, obviously the first one is mentoring. And there are so many forms of mentoring, and it is so um, almost um, fetishized in the the um, if you are online, you know you, you, the aim is you get a mentor for, and and your all your problems are solved. But in fact, there are many styles of mentoring, and there are many types of mentors. Um, I had two, I think, in my career that I think were, were really important. One was when I was a young um, undergraduate. And I met a, a guy called Dan Witter, and I, I had the opportunity of working with him as a volunteer for an organisation. And he would, I would go in there, and we'd probably spend about an hour a week just talking archaeology. And it helped that he was a student of one of the leading um, archaeologists in the world, so we could ask questions about things, and he could sit down there and say, "That's that, and that's this is that." So that was really, really important. And secondly, probably when I was had been in my career for about five to 10 years. Um, I met an urban designer who was involved in bringing projects uh, online for the Victorian government using urban design. And she opened my eyes to really a broad range of things, much broader than um, just simply uh, archaeology and history, um, particularly urban form and understanding how form uh, urban form might work in terms of um, creating opportunities and closing off opportunities, um, closed and permeable uh, landscapes, fronts and backs, all that sort of thing. But also she was relating to developers. So you could actually sit down and talk to developers about particular projects. So they were two great mentors for me. Um, but also along the way, there are a lot of people who you meet who also mentor you for five minutes or for half an hour or for a couple of days over a time. And you've got to pick those opportunities up as well because they're really critical and they can help you along the way. And, you know, they're people who you can, you know, ring up and have a chat and say, well, what happened here or what's happened there? And I like also think the other thing about mentoring is you've got to make yourself available to give back. Um, 
even if you're uh, relatively new in the profession, sometimes people will ask you questions or others will ask will will seek advice from you. So mentoring is, in a sense, a two-way street. There are different mentoring styles, and I just found this as a sort of different things that there's the sort of coaching style um, and the non-directive style, and you can see the different way, ways that um, a mentor might operate with you um, over a period of time. Networking. Um, networking is one way to find mentors. It's a good way of finding mentors. Um, there are plenty of network networking events that you can go to. Uh, Meg has talked about quite a lot of them. Um, these volunteering is another form of networking as well. Um, workshops and seminars. There are plenty of workshops and seminars online or, or not online. Um, and I found through my career that when I came to Sydney, I went to quite a few workshops run by the State Archives, as it was then, and they were really great. Uh, you didn't see many professional experience there, but they were really great in terms of showing you where things were, helping you understand how the archives worked, where to find things. Um, so networking events. Um, I find that I can't really work the room. I'm actually quite a shy person. So I go to networking events and I sort of know I have to go there and I have to force myself to go and talk to people um, or, you know, otherwise I'll just be sitting in the wall sort of watching things happen. And it's... It's an annoying trait and it's a bit frustrating, but you've got to really try and, and get yourself into a space where you can actually talk to people. Most people are fairly approachable. I mean, there are some cranky bastards um, <laughs> who you know, um, but generally networking, if you can put yourself out there, you can often find um, a, a reward and, and don't limit yourself to historians. There are often people you find in life who are really rich and valued people who are not historians or who are on the fringes of history who just happen to sort of be um, floating around and you can find a lot of rich experience from them. And oftentimes you find amazing connections with them as well. So that's really the networking side of things. Finally, I guess publishing and finding your voice it's really important as a historian to find your voice. And my personal experience was that for a long time, I was very silent. I spoke to a lot of people about things. And one day I saw some ideas that I had in my head published. Somebody actually thought they were good, published them. And I thought, gee, I was really pissed off. And the reason I was pissed off was not because they published them. It was because I should have published them, you know. Um, and because you don't actually own ideas. You, you just read them for a bit. And so, you you know, if somebody else publishes what you're thinking, well, really, you should have tried to get that out yourself. And so there are various ways of publishing. And one of the things when I started out was really that, you know, publishing was the formal book or the formal journal article. But these days, there are so many different ways of getting your ideas out and so many little steps you can take on the way. There are very few people who can just start out and write the book of the year. Um, but there are, you work your way up. It's like flexing muscle. And um, there are plenty of venues and to publish, and one of which is the Journal of the Royal Australian Historical Society, of which I am the co-editor with Carol Liston. And, um, you know, if you send a manuscript in to us saying that you're, you need a bit of help with it, we can actually help a little bit. And I know a lot of other journals also do help with that. Mentoring is also an extremely useful um, thing to have if you've got a mentor that can help you navigate um, journals. And some academic journals are incredibly difficult to navigate, um, the American ones in particular. And um, sometimes you sort of get referees reports that are totally disheartening um, and be prepared for your first article to come back with sort of red marks all over it and referees reports about an article that you actually don't recognise, but it's the sort of article that the referee want you to write if, because they hadn't bothered to write it themselves rather than the actual topic of the subject. And so it's, it's referees and there are uh, very, very difficult people to negotiate. And speaking as an editor, um, referees are also extremely difficult to negotiate because they sometimes 
write things and you think, I can't actually send this to the, um, uh, the author because it's just so outrageous. Um, so publishing is these things. And it's putting, us, again, putting yourself out there um, and letting and seeing what happens. And because there are so many variety of things, you can take baby steps and, and see where you end up. Uh, I think history is a fantastic journey. Um, I've enjoyed my time doing it, and I'm enjoy- going to look forward to the next 20 or 30 years doing history, um, as well as digging holes all over the place. So <laughs> thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> um, okay, so um, as a, I- I'm just going to quickly summarise some of the points that I thought was interesting, and then I'm going to ask you all for one next step that you would recommend for um, the people who are here with us tonight. Um, We heard uh, our panellists suggesting that you just need to get involved and build relationships and put yourself out there. Um, I like this idea that you should maybe dare yourself to do something that you think is a little bit beyond you, but perhaps by finding some people that you can collaborate with. Now, get clear for yourself about what your passions are, what excite you, and find some people, generate some people around your enthusiasm with which you can do, with whom you can do something like a history council event. Um, Ian's idea of finding your own voice seems really important. Find your own voice, find what you're passionate about and let those two things sort of generate um, some ideas, some projects, as well as setting clear expectations for other people. Perhaps you need to set some clear expectations for yourself. How long are you going to commit to this? How long are you going? How long are you prepared to keep trying? You know, to think about Carlin's ideas about keep going and having persistence. You know, maybe if you say this is a six month enterprise, you can get yourself some um, goals and guidelines along the way to help you do that. But also setting some intentions. What is it that you really, really want to get out of a job? What sort of things appeal to you? You know, refine that for yourself. And then, you know, when you can start to generate opportunities that might um, be in that vicinity. So understand that you are going to get faster and better at your work is something that Ian also suggested. This need to be adaptable is something that all of our speakers mentioned, finding people to build relationships with as mentors, engaging. Really what we do as historians is it's not just research and processing and understanding ideas. It's connecting those ideas to people's hearts and minds. It's the ability to connect. So think about your skills as a communicator and how you can refine and develop those and look for opportunities to do that. So those are some of the things that have come out for me. What I'm really inspired. <laughs> I feel like going and becoming a historian all over again. It's great. So thank you very, very, very much. These are suggestions that I think are not just for people at the start of their career, but people at all sorts of different stages can be renewed and refreshed by those. So my final questions for each of you is what would be one next step that you would um, suggest for people um, in, in a sort of, next step stage of their career. They're not quite sure where they're going to go next, but they need one challenge or provocation or inspiration from you to keep going. Carlin, let's go with you. This is difficult to answer because it's, uh, I'm going to give some advice. It's something I'm not good at and it's, and it's really not you. It's just saying what everyone else has said. But next step is talk to someone, go to an event, Go, do something that you're thinking you might not do, go and do it and put yourself out there. Yeah. But That's just brilliant. Really I love it. Put yourself out there a little bit more and dare yourself beyond your, your boundaries. I think that's great. Meg, what have you got for us? Um, I would say, especially at the moment where like most of us are locked inside, um, write a list of the things that you're really passionate about, the types of history that really engage you. Revisit some article or book or historical documentary, whatever it is that really inspires you. And then jot down some ideas of where you might like to take that passion if you could, because I think that actually writing down your ideal job, your perfect world helps you really navigate the direction you want to go in. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ian? Well, I was thinking of of two things. I think we're thinking that um, 
in the last lockdown, I, I revisited some of the classic archaeology texts and, and just wrote a little bit about them and then pu- put them on a, on a, a website called the Campaign for Sensible Archaeology. Um, so that's a fun thing to do. Um, the other thing is to perhaps on your morning walks or your evening walks, walk around the suburb that you're in and have a look at the environment and think about the history that you're walking through and seeing, thinking about the landscape that you're walking through and thinking, think back a bit and think, well, what was it in colonial times? What was it in Aboriginal times? Um, the, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is just walk around and, and think. So that's, that's something I would suggest. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. And, and I would suggest some um, list writing, What, as well as some of your passions, what are some of the things you actually do know? What are some of the skills that you already have? Why don't you perk yourself up a little bit by recognising um, the qualities that you already have and then in that you might see some areas where you'd like to develop yourself a little bit more and that could help you work out what next step you'd like to take but also a potential mentor if there's an area where you want to develop more maybe it's communication maybe it's writing maybe it's putting yourself out there maybe you need to find a mentor who's going to give you some skills and encouragement or um, a nice big boot on the bum to get out there and do it so um, I think we really need to think thank our fabulous speakers tonight um, it was so rich so practical um, and yet also reminded us that history is um, a really exciting passion to be part of. It's always growing and evolving. There's so many different ways you can do it, whether it's in a chook shed or down a hole or uh, or in a um, or with some with filmmakers. There's just it's always changing and evolving and you should never despair. And sometimes it's up to you to go out there and create that opportunity and job for yourself. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you for you for coming along to another History Council event. And um, and thank you to our staff, Catherine Shirley and Cassandra Rogers at the History Council, who do so much work behind the scenes to make these events look so smooth. We'll be running another Careers in History event in October and November, which will be a joint event with the Professional Historians as the Association of New South Wales and ACT. So check out us on the social media challenge channels as well. And just remember also, as Meg mentioned, that every year we have a history week. This year um, our theme is history from the ground up. It's about everything from archaeology to um, cemeteries to environmental histories to histories that are radical and come from the roots all the way up. So that will be running from the 3rd of September um, until the 12th of September. So check that out on our website. And why not pick up um, the gauntlet, the glove that Meg threw down and, uh, and run a history event for History Week. It's open for all comers and would love to have you there, especially if you've dared yourself out of your comfort zone. So um, also one last thing to know is that we have our awards prizes ceremony coming later in the year, and that might be something that you also want to set a goal for yourself to win one of those awards sometime in the future. The History Council of New South Wales is funded by Create New South Wales, and um, and we're really proud and um, of the work that we do. So thank you very much for our staff, to our contributors, and to you out there. We would be nothing without you. So have a great night and good luck, and we hope to see you out either in cyberspace or in real-life history world. Thank you.